Brain dopamine and the mesocortical dopaminergic system is involved in our everyday habitual behaviors. So in this video I thought I would provide a clear explanation on what are the different parts of this mesocortical dopaminergic system, how it relates to everyday habit formation through reinforcement learning, and how can you use these principles step by step to make new habits or break old habits. Hi and welcome back to my channel. I am Inka Land. I have a master's in neuropsychology and in this channel I discuss brain health, mental well-being and science. So many habits form via a process called reinforcement learning which is mediated by the mesocortical dopaminergic system. This system can be roughly divided into two parts or separate systems that interact and interconnect. One is the medial system, medial meaning more in the middle, and the other one is the lateral system, which is more anatomically in the side. So I'll start with the medial system and I explain this whole thing to a process where someone forms a habit of getting Starbucks Frappuccino. Because I mean, they are pretty good and it's easy to get hooked and addicted to Starbucks Frappuccinos. So let's say there is a Starbucks along the road, which you use to walk to work. And let's say also that some of your friends, for example, has told you that, hey, Starbucks has these frappuccinos and they taste pretty good, you should try. So one day you are going to your work, you see the Starbucks and you decide that, hey, I'm going to try this frappuccino. And at this point, your habit, oh, sorry, your behavior is driven by your prefrontal plant executive ne network, which you use to make these kind of goal-directed behaviors. So this is not yet a habit, right? But habits usually start from these kind of moments where we one day we decide to do something. So in this day, you go into the Starbucks and you get a Frappuccino. And actually in Starbucks, in Frappuccinos, they have a lot of sugar. Even if it's just a coffee Frappuccino with any extra flavors or additions, it has 45 grams of sugar. That, that's because they use their own this kind of... Starbucks coffee syrup. They don't actually make it to coffee, they make it to the syrup. So this is a massive amount of sugar, would definitely cause this rapid burst of dopamine in your mesocortical dopaminergic system to reinforce this behavior. Of course, this also has caffeine, which upregulates the striatal D2 and D3 dopamine receptors and increases your alertness. So your brain interprets this as a reward. As I said, this activates the medial dopamine system, which runs from ventral tegmental area and ventral medial substantia nigra to anterior cingulate cortex and medial prefrontal cortex. So this system releases a phasic burst of dopamine, which marks this rewarding feeling and the associated cues around it. So basically, the things that you see, the coffee house, what drink did you get, the movements that you just made, um, your order, the type of a coffee, and so on. In this context, this system forms reward prediction. Reward prediction is this process in your brain where your brain has made a prediction that certain cue associated with a following behavior will re lead to reward. So now Starbucks becomes your visual cue as a potential reward. So next day you again walk past the Starbucks, you see the logo, that's the cue. And this activates the medial dopamine system to release another burst of dopamine already before you even enter, before you even get the drink, just to make you more alert about this cue and the potential reward. And this activates also another dopamine system, the lateral system. And the point of the lateral system is to be a salience signaling system. So it makes you more alert about the, the cue or more attentive to the cue. The lateral dopamine system projects from lateral substantia nigra to the lateral prefrontal cortex. It's linked to D1 and D2 receptor families in your prefrontal cortex. And these receptors are utmost important for your attention and focus. This also activates the memory for the action sequence and the movements and everything that led to the reward. So there is a certain amount of pull from your brain towards that behavior. And now if you follow through that behavior again and the next day and the next day, you get this long-term potentiation in these pathways, which just makes it super easy for you to do again and again and again. 
So when do we know that it's a habit? So basically your brain works the following way, as shown by several animal studies where they have studied the neurotransmitters linked to habit formation. When you start going to the Starbucks and you drink that drink, then after the drink you get a reward. You get an elevation in your medial mesocortical dopamine. But after a time, this post-reward dopamine starts to attenuate. Slowly and slowly you get less and less dopamine after drinking the drink. And you get more dopamine before you enter to the Starbucks. So your brain kind of shifts this dopamine to the anticipation of the reward rather than the actual rewarding feeling. So the prediction of the reward will increase the dopamine which initiates the habit. So how fast does this habit form then? Well, that depends a lot of things actually. It depends on how consistent you are with this behavior, how similar the environment is that you do it in, and how rewarding is the reward, how fatigued you are when you are doing it, and how much you recruit cognitive control. So for example, make decisions when you're doing it. And I'll soon discuss more about this when we talk about breaking habits. So if you wanted to make new habits, could you use these principles? Yes, you can. So let's say you would like to start exercise in the morning, for example. So first step would be to choose a visual cue. So for example, you could place a yoga mat in a visible place in the living room and then you can just lock your visual attention to it, which would mark the starting moment of the habit. Second step would be to use some sort of habitual routine behaviors with the math. So you would take it, you would roll it out and you would do a habitual routine exercise in the mat. Studies show that people who stick to habitual exercises are more likely to do them because it just requires less cognitive effort from your brain and it's easier to kind of imprint it into your habitual networks. The reward, of course, from exercise is already that it elevates endorphins, dopamine and serotonin. But if you would like to really reinforce this reward in your brain, you could end, for example, the exercise with a brief like relaxation or meditation or something where you would really pay attention on how good it feels inside your body. And then the next step would be just to repeat it every single day with the same actions and habits and time and nervous system arousal and basically it should start feeling less and less effortful a long time and it should start feeling like a habit and as I told it depends on so many different things on how long it takes some studies show that it can form as fast as in two weeks and in some cases it can take months so what if you want to break a habit so let's discussed for example a snacking behavior because that's quite common these days so there is of course a lot to discuss about blood sugar balance and getting enough amino acids and those things but i'm just going to focus on the the habit formation when it comes to snacks breaking a habit needs a down regulation of this mesocortical dopamine this is achieved with forming what is called a reward prediction error. It's pretty much just breaking the pattern. So the key thing is that the outcome is not what expected. So the expectation of a reward is broken, which then makes your dopamine system to sort of recalibrate the dopamine. So how we can cause a reward prediction error. So a few things could do it immediately. For example, if you have a habit of snacking chocolate from your cupboard, but then one day the door breaks and you cannot open the door. Of course, that's already meaning that you won't get the chocolate, but it does also something very important, which is it will disrupt the flow of the events, which activates your prefrontal cortex because you need to make a new action plan. So basically your dopamine system goes like, hmm, okay, this cue does not always lead to this behavior and this reward. So this outcome is not always happening. So it starts reconsidering if it's worth doing in the first place. Reward prediction error could also follow if, for example, the chocolate is expired and you get super nauseous from it. But according to studies, this is not the most effective way of breaking habits. This is actually called devaluation of the outcome or devaluation of the reward. 
but it doesn't disrupt the flow of the events and it still doesn't recruit your prefrontal cortex. So it, to be more effective with breaking habits, we need to disrupt the flow of the events. The next thing that works is activating the prefrontal cortex for analytical thinking. The more you need to think, make plans and act differently, the easier it is to break a habit. And actually one effective technique seems to be self-instructions. So just by telling yourself, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, and then creating an alternative action plan and following that alternative action plan, it recruits a lot of areas in your prefrontal cortex, like your frontal motor cortex and your Broca's area for internal speech and the analytical executive network for action planning. The next is choices. Choices also reduce habits because again, you need to activate your conscious thought. So you could have, for example, three different choices of this dessert. And if you always have to make decision, you're less likely to form a habit to one of them. Finally, one thing, very effective thing that you can do is just to remove the cue. So not having snacks in the house, will reduce the snacking behavior. So, or with the Starbucks example, if you would take an alternative route to work where there are no Starbucks, you wouldn't have the cue of the Starbucks logo or the Starbucks environment, and you are less likely to go in, of course, because there is no Starbucks. So actually, this is why naturally occurring life transitions like moving to another town or moving to another apartment are said to be windows of opportunity for habitual change. So as a summary in this video, I covered how the medial and lateral mesocortical dopamine systems are involved in reinforcement behavior and habits. Dopamine is a super essential, important and fascinating neurotransmitter and neuromodulator for our everyday behaviors, motivation and mood. And if you want to learn more about this neurotransmitter, for example, you can check my other videos too. And I also have a lot of other videos about health and well-being. So make sure to check my channel if you're interested in these topics and comment your questions below. And I hope to see you in the next video.